everybody. Happy Easter. It's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, April 21st, 2019. We have our new restaurant. Finally, we've been waiting for this. Genoa City Society. <laughs> What do you guys think? Do you like the restaurant? Do you like the name? Do you like the overall vibe? I thought that would be a fun poll question to kick us off for the week at yrchat.com. Sound off about our new restaurant. Do you think it's like a five star or do you think it's a total flop? I really quite like it. I think that the decor is really fresh. It's modern, it feels new. I don't think it's too masculine or too feminine. I like the bar, I like the fireplace, and it also seems very realistic almost more realistic than any of our other restaurant sets have been. One little detail that I noticed was that society has a restroom. There was one little spot on the set, it was near where Kyle and Lola had snuck off to have their private moment, where you could see there was a door that had the little restroom symbols on it. And I don't know, that I've ever seen another restaurant or public area set on the show where there were actual restrooms. <laughs> I just assumed these people did not go. <laughs> and I don't know if it is just a door, if it's a fake out, or if it actually is gonna lead into a powder room. I think it would be kinda cool to have a powder room set where the ladies could go and touch up their makeup and you know get bitchy with each other. That would be fun. But for right now, I, I really like it. I think it seems really fun and it gives us, it's like having something new to wear. <laughs> I like it. And I think that Abby will make a perfectly lovely hostess for our townspeople. If she can get anyone to come, she rolled out a red carpet for this restaurant opening event and there wasn't a single person standing on it. I felt really bad for her. I'm sure that they're gonna come. I mean, with the way that everything went wrong with this opening, she probably accidentally sent out the invitations with the wrong date on it or something. There'll be some little snafu, but everyone will show up eventually. I mean, it was opening night and absolutely everything that could go wrong with a restaurant went wrong. Instead of prawns, they got pineapples. The high-tech restaurant run-in software that they installed has gone haywire. And Abby accidentally got one of Elvis Presley's silver sparkly suits instead of an appropriate evening gown <laughs> that she should have been wearing. I mean, that suit, that thing was more talkable, more talk of the town than the whole restaurant, I think, itself. It was blinding. I think the only thing she needed to complete that look was a gemstone studded cape. She really could have given us the full Elvis effect. <laughs> Oh, or maybe Arturo was the one who should have been wearing the cape, considering he's the one who saved the day or saved the evening, one or the other. Arturo was able to sweep in and he helped Lola talk through her anxiety about what the heck she was gonna do with all these pineapples. He gave her a pep talk, let her know that she's a Rosales and she can persevere. And he also ended up working with one of the contractors to make it so that the fire alarms aren't going off every 60 seconds. <laughs> so way to go, Arturo. He was being a really good, sweet guy this week. He was giving these extra cute puppy dog looks too that were breaking my heart knowing 
then I'm not gonna be able to keep him. He's gonna be gone soon. Early in the week, uh, Arturo pays a visit to Abby at the restaurant amidst all of the construction dust. And it's really easy to forget in all of the drama that happened with their relationship that Arturo was the person who encouraged Abby to go forward with pursuing this dream of opening a restaurant even when Nick, for instance, was not encouraging toward her. This was something that Abby and Arturo were doing together. They were researching together. He was supposed to be there to help her build it. I think in an emotional support way, but also he had the knowledge to fix these little construction tweaks. He's a builder, that's what he does for a living. And so the fact that he was there helping her out on this very important night was significant. Even if their relationship is completely off the table, it was significant that he made an effort to show up and to talk to her and to say, hey, I know this is an important night for you and I'm sorry about the way things happened, but I still wanna be here to support you. And I think Abby was maybe feeling lonely and maybe a week, maybe a little weak and maybe a little stressed out, but I really got the impression that she was ready to take him back. The conversation they had was therapeutic. He was very apologetic and he seemed really honest and really genuine and Abby accepted it. She accepted his apology and she said she understands what it's like to be on that end of a cheating scandal and she believed that Arturo deserved a second chance. It really truly seemed like this was a couple who was going to get a second chance and then Mia walks in. She has hunted Arturo down. She is demanding his time and Abby just immediately snaps back into mission mode when it comes to her restaurant and then all of the old feelings that she had about everything that went down with Arturo and him sleeping with Mia. All of that just came rushing back to her and she ended up kicking them both out into the street or into, into Chancellor Park. She kicks them out into Chancellor Park where Arturo and Mia now have a chance to talk. Mia is telling Arturo that he better listen to her and what she has to say because she is pregnant, the baby might be his, and oh yeah, she's gonna need an alibi for the night of Lola's attack. What a flood of emotion and information that must have been on Arturo. This woman's having my baby, and she totally attacked my sister. All of that drama, all of that time he was sitting by Lola's bedside, it was because of Mia. This is a woman who has kind of ruined his life and has ruined the family. And yet, I do wonder if Arturo still loves her because he gave her court, he listened to what she had to say, he agreed ultimately to give her the alibi. Of course, some of that was because of Ray's pushing, but when Mia gave him that sonogram photo and he was staring at it throughout the week, he even took it to the restaurant opening and Abby noticed that he was staring at it. I thought to myself, well, I wonder if there's a part of Arturo that wants this. Maybe Arturo sees this as his opportunity for that second chance. If he can't have it with Abby, maybe he can have it with Mia. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Mia is not gonna have a miscarriage. Maybe there's not gonna be some big awful event that's gonna send these Rosaleses all off the map in a dramatic and sad way. Is there any chance do you think that Mia and Arturo might actually decide to leave town and raise their child together? Is there any chance that there is actually going to be a happy ending for these two, for, th th for this couple who we are told were each other's first loves? Ray tells Sharon all about the position that he's in with Paul and the GCPD, 
that he's covering up Mia's crime for the sake of her and possibly his unborn baby. Now, it made me a little mad at Ray when he said that if it turns out that the baby is his, then he wants to keep Mia's lie and keep her safe. But if it's not his kid, then he would want to turn her in? I don't understand. What's the difference, man? If the kid turns out to just be your little niece or nephew, then you'd want to tell the truth? That's kind of crappy. I also cannot believe that Sharon didn't even dare mention the fact that Ray arrested her for the crime of homicide and yet chose to cover up Mia's crime. I was really thinking that Sharon deserved to at least have a snarky comment about that, but there was nothing. Ray and Sharon almost seem like they're dancing on eggshells around each other because they don't want to lose each other again. He doesn't want to lose her, and he doesn't want to lie to her, and I think she's grateful just to be able to be with him after all this time. But, <laughs> even though Ray does not want to be caught lying or slipping around Sharon, he doesn't want to do anything to destroy his new relationship, he has absolutely no problem whatsoever lying to Paul. Paul? has wisely and maybe strategically asked Ray to investigate Lola's assault case and Ray came up with the lamest excuse <laughs> to tell Paul for trying to get himself out of this predicament. He doesn't want to tell Paul that he knows the truth about who did it. And he has to come up with something if he wants his job back and if he doesn't want to look suspicious. And so he tells Paul, hey, okay, what if though, this whole Lola assault thing, what if, just tossing it out there, what if there was no crime at all? Yeah, 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 okay. So maybe we only thought that Lola was attacked and maybe Lola just, slipped and fell instead and you know all that evidence uh, everything it's probably just a coincidence or something <laughs> sure that's not suspicious at all that's some real good detective work there ray good thing ray already has another job lined up nikki and victoria are now hot on Victor's trail. Victoria tells Nikki all about Spider and Vegas, and Nikki says, oh, no, no, no. I'm about to find out what my husband is up to. So they go to Victor's office, and they find in his desk drawer a bill from a psychiatrist in Las Vegas. I have to back up one sec and just say that I really liked seeing Victor's office set again. It's been a while. I'm gonna take that as a good sign that maybe we'll be seeing more of Victor and his office and more of the Newman Halls. You know I love them. But when Nikki finds this psychiatrist bill, she knows right away that never in a million years would Victor Newman subject his big head <laughs> to a shrinking. <laughs> no way, it's just not him. So Nikki can't get any answers from Victor. So she goes to Paul and Christine to ask them if they can help her find out what Victor has been up to. Nikki going to Paul and Christine for help with what Victor is up to is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. These should be the last two people on earth that she should ever go to. If by chance Victor is up to anything illegal, Paul and Christine would slap handcuffs on Victor in about a millisecond. They've been 
looking for something to nail Victor with at any cost, even at the cost of JT's life and sanity, for years now. Why would she go to them? That made no sense. And when they just say, nope, sorry, can't help you, I don't know why they wouldn't take the bait. They should love this. They should be jumping on this. But they said, no thanks. And Nikki goes to Ray instead, which I, I, he gives it some thought and he accepts Nikki's offer as a paid job to go find out what Victor's up to. And I guess it's a little bit more understandable that maybe Ray could help her. He's not on the police force right now officially. And he did help her get out of those pesky little murder charges that Paul and Christine just tried to convict her for. Leave Victor out of it. Paul and Christine just tried to convict you and did convict you with murder. <laughs> and now you're sitting in the coffee house being all chummy with them? Hmm. <laughs> Something about that just doesn't seem right. I don't know how long we're going to be on this trail. I think next week's shows are going to be occupied largely with Neil's, the end of Neil's storyline. So I don't know how quickly we're going to be getting back to what's going on with Victor. I'm going to toss out a little prediction here, though, and say that I think Ray is ultimately going to lead them to the psychiatrist. And I think that the psychiatrist is the person who we saw in that photo. And I'm imagining that the psychiatrist will then lead us to Spider, who is AKA Adam. And just like that, with the breaking of glass, Mariah and Tessa have a brand new storyline. It was just what I was asking for last week. We had this romantic dinner between them at Crimson Lights. Tessa serenades Mariah with her brand new song. And at the end of it, of this romantic moment, we get a brick thrown through the window of the coffee house. And at first I thought, whoa, is this a hate group or something? Because Mariah and Tessa are lesbians, are we going there? But then Mariah picked up the brick and there was a note attached that said something to the effect of, stop gossiping, you're ruining people's lives. So this is clearly about her work with GC Buzz. It's weird though, because whoever did it had to have been following Mariah. Mariah mentioned that Sharon had shut down the coffee house so that Mariah and Tessa could have this romantic private dinner. Someone must have known exactly where Mariah was at that time. It wasn't just random. They're obviously stalking her too. I don't know who it could be though. We really haven't even seen GC Buzz in a while and Mariah hasn't talked much about her reporting or any specific stories that she's been working on. So who could it be that is feeling offended by Mariah's gossip show? I don't know. Is there any chance it could be somehow related to Chloe and Kevin and his return? Ashley sends Jack a copy of her brand new ad campaign for Jack of Hearts. And the ad is featuring a scantily clad Carrie with another man. It was like the cover of a romance novel, that ad. <laughs> and it really made me cringe for Jack seeing his ex-girlfriend modeling for the perfume she created supposedly in his honor. Oh, Jack seems to be on the precipice of something. There's something he is getting ready to experience or do or evolve toward. Early in the week, Dina, in her diseased mind state, 
had challenged Jack's ability to run Jabot Cosmetics in a fashion that his father would be proud of. And Jack lashed out at her. He knows that she's diseased. And yet this is still his mother saying these horrible things to him that his father would be not proud of him. And he just unleashes all of these repressed feelings that he has toward her. And it must be incredibly frustrating and heartbreaking for Jack to want to express all of those repressed feelings to a woman who is both there and not there at the same time. And in many ways, I think that describes the nature of Dina's presence in the family. She was never physically there for the family, and yet she had this ghost with an enormously huge presence in Jack's life. So he's still trying to process all of this. He goes to the office late one night and he falls asleep and he has a dream that he is confronting the past version of Dina, the younger version of Dina that we've seen, the one who looks like Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> these questions for her and he has all these things he wants to say to her he wants to confront the woman who left the family all of those years ago because there's no point in confronting the woman who is meandering around the mansion today she's not there so he's talking in his dream to this past version of Dina demanding answers from her asking her how she could abandon the family, his sisters, his father. How could she do this to them? And of course, Dream Dina really isn't able to provide any new information. It's all just a dream. It's all just speculation. And it's all just Jack struggling internally to fill in the blanks about why she would have done this. And since she can't really tell him, she instead asks him a very important question. Tells him, you need to not focus on the past. You need to focus on the present. What is it that you really want now in the present? Because Jabot was always your father's dream. What's your dream? And I thought that was such a odd question to be asking, to be bringing up right now, right as Jack is getting Jabot back for the first time in a long time. But I guess also in a way, it's not an odd question because there Jack is sitting in his office chair late one night, all alone. It's empty all around him. He has no love, no romance. He's got this endless, feud going on with Ashley. His son is repeating the sins of the father. So maybe it is an appropriate question for him to be asking right now. And an appropriate question for us to be asking right now is, you know, what is next for Jack Abbott that extends beyond the four walls of Jabot? Kyle breaks the news to Lola that he couldn't break the news to Summer, that he wants to break up with Summer. And why didn't Kyle go through with breaking up with Summer? It's for Lola's sake, don't you know? He doesn't want Summer to go all Phyllis on him and leak those extramarital photos of him in a jealous rage and ruin Lola's brand new budding career. So last week, Summer was a little lost lamb who Kyle could not bear to break her heart. And this week, Summer is a vindictive vixen who will take her revenge out on Lola and Kyle and Kyle's entire family company. Make up your mind.
YNR, really? Which is it? Phyllis is the bad guy for taking photos of what Kyle and Lolo were doing in public, and Summer's now the bad guy just simply for being Phyllis's daughter. Well, Kyle decides <laughs> that he had better just stay with Summer for now, better stay on her good side. And in fact, it's smarter to just try to convince Summer that she doesn't really want to be with Kyle in the first place. If he can convince Summer that she doesn't want to be with him, like a reverse psychology thing, then he won't have to incur her wrath, Lola won't have to incur her wrath, and Jabot won't have to incur her wrath. And so we drag it out yet another week. How many more weeks? How many more months? And Lola is completely fine with all of this. She's completely fine with Kyle just stringing Summer along her because of her career. <laughs> but he better not sleep with her. That's the one condition that Lola has. I'll go along with this. It's fine. I get it for some reason, but you better not sleep with her. How is that going to work? Kyle's going to be laying down next to Summer every single night and Summer's not going to notice that he is now dodging all of her many, many, many advances. And there are many. <laughs> there are already many. I don't know. I just don't know. I wonder if Summer's about to turn a corner. Kyle told Summer what her mother was up to. And Summer goes to confront Phyllis. And instead of, I don't know, leaving in a huff and rushing out and being continually angry with her mother, Summer ends up at the end of the confrontation in a puddle of tears in her mother's arms asking for forgiveness for what happened with Billy. I didn't see that coming either. I, I, I thought we were resolved on that. I thought the two women had gotten past it. And don't get me wrong, it was a really great scene. Both of the actresses nailed it and it doesn't hurt I guess, to have a continued resolution around what happened in that story. But it's also another glaring example of how different Summer has become. Uh, six months ago, I don't think she would have been so forgiving toward her mother. And today, she is soft. And she's so easily hurt. And she's so sensitive. And Maybe bringing up what happened with Billy is the storyteller's way of reminding us what changed Summer, why Summer changed, and why it's so important for her to feel loved by the man that she's with. But it's a, 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 a terrible way to go about it. I said it last week and I will say it again, Summer is no victim of the screwed up situation that she is calling a marriage to Kyle right now. She's asking for it. And yet my heart breaks for her. My heart breaks for her when she discovers this simple little dainty heart necklace that Kyle has tucked away in his coat pocket that he has bought as a present for Lola on the opening night of her restaurant. And Summer assumes that it's a gift for her, that Kyle's going to be giving her this gift at the restaurant opening. I mean, the heart necklace matches her heart tattoo perfectly, of course it should be for her. It's a logical assumption. If the necklace were for Lola, then the pendant would not have been in the shape of a heart. It would have been in the shape of a liver. <laughs> Obviously. And 
again, I know Summer is setting herself up for it, but my heart is breaking for her as she's picking out dresses, deciding to wear the dress that she thinks will perfectly complement the piece of jewelry as Kyle assuredly hangs it around her neck at the restaurant opening. And my heart just breaks for her knowing that she's breaking her own heart. She's setting up this expectation that a man is going to magically fall out of love with someone else and fall into love with her. And it's just not going to happen. And the more that Kyle is unclear with her, the worse it's going to be. Continuing to lie and be fraudulent about the relationship is only going to make her more angry. The intent of staying with Summer is to try to save some pain and some anger, but how can he not see that it's only causing it? I still feel so pissed at Kyle. And I have to ask you, when exactly do you guys think that Kyle was planning on giving Lola that necklace? Because Summer had to talk Kyle into going to that restaurant opening. And you can call me cynical, but how much you want to bet that what Kyle was really planning was to sneak out and go to that restaurant after Summer had gone to bed. How much do you want to bet? I think he was going to sneak out on Summer that night, just in the same way that he snuck out on Summer when they got to the restaurant at the first sight of Lola. Kyle and Lola steal a few moments away together off in the corner of the restaurant while Abby is giving Summer a tour. And Kyle presents Lola with the necklace. And he explains, by the way, that he put a lot of thought into this gift. This was not an expensive necklace. <laughs> it was decidedly simple. <laughs> and I have to give Lola some props for acknowledging that these two haven't had a whole lot of luck with gifts. <laughs> that was very self-aware of her. But when Summer realizes that Kyle is no longer by her side on this restaurant tour, he's just disappeared, she glances over into the corner and where is he? He's embracing Lola. Now Summer didn't see the necklace. Summer didn't know anything about the necklace. So Summer marches over there, interrupts them, doing her very best impression of someone who is in control of the situation when she is not. And Summer hands Lola a little gift of her own. It's a big, crazy, sharp knife. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, that is beyond good. I am like back in this story. The second I saw that knife come out, I was like, oh, this is okay. <laughs> this has fast become my favorite story to complain about. And now you add in a, a big, crazy, sharp knife. Okay. <laughs> Oh, count me in. <laughs> this is a gift that Summer has gone out and picked for Lola, but she's addressed the card from her and Kyle. This is Summer's way of showing that there's unity between she and Kyle, and this is now a, we are giving you a gift. We are acknowledging your existence, but we are a couple. And as Lola takes the gift bag from Summer's hands. Lola also unfiddles a little and untucks her necklace from her collar. And Summer realizes it. She looks down at Lola's neck and can see that Lola is wearing the gift 
from Kyle that she thought was for her. And the look on her face was like, hey guys, why don't you just take that big, crazy, sharp knife and now plunge it into my back? I'm just, uh, the knife seems really <gasps> ominous, but also really intriguing to me at the same time. It's, it's the, the knife is ominous and yet it's in the, in the best of ways. There's this element of how perfect that knife gift is because Summer had given Lola the gift of going under the knife with the liver transplant. <laughs> But also, it is a big, crazy, sharp knife. That thing could be a weapon. And I can help but notice that it also has Lola's initials on it. Lola's name's on the knife. It was monogrammed. <laughs> Please tell me that there is not going to be some maybe staged crime against Summer where that knife conveniently is placed at the scene. And if that happens, please also tell me that Ray is not gonna be the one to investigate it because it will be going on for the next three years. Who goes to Las Vegas, sleeps with some hot random rocker dude, and then considers getting engaged to someone else the very next week. <laughs> Victoria, apparently. It is blowing my mind that she is so ready to hop back on board with any kind of relationship with Billy right now, even if it's not marriage. And it was kind of blowing Nikki's mind too. When Victoria gets back into town and tells Nikki all about how she and Billy reconnected in Vegas. The, the real way that conversation should have gone was Nikki saying, so what exactly was it that made you reconnect with Billy? And Victoria saying, well, I slept with someone else. <laughs> it's just so sudden and so ridiculous to me. I can't help it. It, it's not that I don't, it's, it, Billy was trying, he's trying, and he sets up this romantic evening for them. He's got wine and roses, and it's so clear that he wants Victoria to feel comfortable. I don't doubt that Billy wants to make Victoria happy, and that he loves her, and that not only that, he wants to have a family with her. He was trotting those kids in and out of the scene, <laughs> but only when necessary for hugs and dessert, which I think is the way that kids should be trotted in and out of scenes. Now go bake some cookies. <laughs> go bake some cookies with the help. <laughs> uh, I know that Billy's heart is in the right place. I just, I worry about Billy's mind a lot of the time. He seems like he could be in a little bit of a shaky place, but I don't know, he gets down on one knee and he pops out that ring box and he pops the question on Victoria and then ding dong, Phyllis shows up at the door and Phyllis not only pulls him away from the marriage proposal with Victoria, but she literally pulls him out of the house. They had to go back to her hotel suite for what reason, I don't know. <laughs> and Phyllis proceeds to re-air out of the blue everything that happened in their relationship right down to sleeping with Summer. And I know that it was not exactly out of the blue. It was a result of Summer talking to Phyllis about it. But in terms of story, it came a little bit out of the blue. And I'm sure that in Billy's mind, maybe it came a little bit out of the blue. But it also felt like a manipulation. It felt like Phyllis was priming Billy. Like she was setting him up 
for the perfect guilt trip when she laid it all out about how horrible it was, what he did to Phyllis in summer, and then she turned around and asked him for money. It's not blackmail though. It is definitely not blackmail. She is definitely not threatening to tell Jack and Nick and Victoria or Victoria about this terrible, awful thing that he did. She just wants Billy to give her some cash and then they can call it even, just between them. They're even. Billy says, uh, how much you need? <laughs> and the next thing we know, Phyllis is type, type, typing away at her keyboard, presumably coming up with some kind of brand new business plan, which Billy has just funded I don't know how that's gonna look Billy goes home now to Victoria to try to finish up the marriage proposal that he started that he just got interrupted it was like marriage proposal pause <laughs> go deal with Phyllis's BS come back play <laughs> oh well I wonder how everybody felt about the marriage proposal. Last week I asked you guys if you want to see Billy and Victoria get back together. 80% of you said yes. So I'm over here in this teeny tiny little 20% majority wishing that this wasn't going on. But 80% of you want this relationship. And I'm assuming you also eventually want the marriage. I guess that means that 80% of you were highly disappointed when Victoria doesn't say yes to Billy's proposal. But she also didn't say no either. Victoria took a lot of time considering Billy's proposal. She thought back on all of the moments and terms of their relationship. And I thought that the flashbacks were really nice. This version of Billy and Victoria with Amelia Heinley and Jason Thompson, they've been dancing around a relationship, I think since he was cast, but I don't think we've ever really seen these two together in the the actors who are playing the characters now. So half of the flashbacks that we saw were just him or her begging to get back together and I don't think they ever really fully did. And it also occurred to me that in those flashbacks how many times did Billy or Victoria say the words rum or Jamaica? And I love that that's part of their history. Remember when they also had the St. Patrick's Day shtick? I, I mean, I, I, I remember Jamaica. I remember the magic. I remember the rum and I was there for it. Uh, but I also feel like it was a it was a different actor playing Billy and so we're not really able to re-experience that through the flashbacks we can only really allude to the fact that there was Jamaica and there was rum or there was St. Patrick's Day like all of that is in the past and we can't even see it we can't even bring it up in flashbacks so that's kind of disappointing and it also maybe makes it slightly harder for the pull to be in the past. Like, I don't feel that there's a current pull for Billy and Victoria to get back together because it just happened so quick and it was so circumstantial and she was in jail like three weeks ago. And yet the pull of the past isn't really there either because YNR can't show us those memories. I think that if Billy and Victoria are gonna work for me, <laughs> we're gonna need to make some new memories. And the thing is that, that I just, I don't know if it is going to happen. There's like no way that Victoria is not going to realize here pretty soon that Billy just gave Phyllis a whole bunch of cash. And where did he get it? Uh, 
I don't know, he was at half a million dollars in debt the last time I checked, but he gave Phyllis the capital that she asked for, and sooner or later, Victoria is going to find out why, and it's gonna blow their whole relationship sky high again. Kane is like this little lost boy. <sighs> And the, with the way that he apologized to Billy, he went to the Abbott Mansion and specifically apologized to Billy about the little fight that they had previously. It made me think that maybe Kane and Billy would end up fighting over Victoria. That, that little moment of, hey, let's bury the hatchet made me think, hmm, I wonder if they'll be unburying that hatchet over Victoria. I would kind of rather get back to what we started with Victoria and Kane than go down the Billy and Victoria road again, but that's just me. I am absolutely fascinated to find out where Kane's journey is headed. And I'm doubly fascinated by the fact that it is intersected with Tracy's journey. I really enjoyed Tracy and Kane connecting again this week. Kane seems to be really earnestly looking for guidance I think he wants to have some kind of outside perspective on himself because he can't see it from the inside. And Tracy is a good listener and she just asks little questions and allows him to talk through himself and his past and to explore who Kane is. Not Kane of Kane and Lily, but just Kane and he was analyzing himself and why he has a tendency to lie and deceive and how it connects into his past and thinking of ways that he can overcome that for the future. And it was really cool the way Tracy and Kane's whole conversation was framed as if Tracy, the novelist, the writer, uh, was helping Kane write the story of his life and it actually inspired Tracy to do that. She got out her laptop and started to type away and Tracy is writing the story based on Kane, deconstructing Kane, the man, but also trying to display the, the, the path that he's on in his, his journey of self-discovery, but also trying to save his relationship with Lily. It's just fascinating to me. And I can't wait to see where Cain goes. And as a result of his self-analysis with Tracy, Cain decided to quit his job at Chancellor. He gave Jill his notice saying and even telling the twins that he just doesn't he, you know if, if he really thinks about it he believes that some of his job is motivated by wanting to just be successful and greedy and this has also created so many other problems in his life so he believes he needs to downsize his life in order to become a better man and in, in order to become the kind of man that Lily deserves I honestly did not expect for Kane to keep fighting for Lily, even after she was really, really clear with him before that he's all out of second chances. And maybe uh, Lily and Kane would have already have been done if not for knowing that Crystal Khalil was going to be coming back for the funeral and that there was an opportunity for them to have some additional resolution there. But part of me thinks Kane is just fighting this lost cause and I wish he'd stop. When Lily comes home from prison, she needs to come back to the house to get some of her belongings and Kane is right there trying to change Lily's mind. And I appreciate that this is the man who loves his wife and wants his wife and would do anything to keep her. But it also feels like Kane is wanting and expecting things to go on as if nothing happened. He very sweetly 
set out before Lily got there this array of bath salts and perfumes and fresh towels and all of these luxury items that he knew that his wife the the woman that he knew a year ago would really appreciate and would revel in and something that would make her feel beautiful and fresh smelling and good and you know and all of the things that she wasn't able to be in prison but she's not the same woman that she was a year ago and Cain refuses to accept that and Lily was trying her best I felt for her I really felt for her because she was trying to be firm with him but she at the same time doesn't want to hurt him she still loves him clearly but it, it, he's not getting it and I don't want her to give him any false hope he is literally grasping at straws for any inroads with her and it almost felt to me like a manipulation did anybody else feel like he was kind of manipulating it, it felt like a, a, a continuation of the kind of behavior that got him here in the first place she's saying i gotta go i've already told you and he's saying, no, why don't you stay the night? You can sleep in your bed one last time. Take a shower. Let your feet you know, soak into the carpet. I know you like that. Lay there in your bed. It's fresh sheets. I mean, it, it, I'll sleep on the couch. That's where I'll be. And just something about that felt manipulative. Like, he knows for sure that there were probably countless nights that Lily was lying there in her prison cot wishing that she was in her bed, wishing she was in her shower. And now he's kind of using that a little bit as a as bait to get her to stay so that he can have some more chances to try to convince her. T t do me one little favor, just one favor. Take me to the restaurant opening as your date. And it's not about me though. It's not about us though. We'll make it about you and about Devon. I'll sign those divorce papers tomorrow. See, I just, it, that, that didn't feel genuine. That just felt like him trying to get somewhere with her. And I don't know how much more clear that Lily can be. And I kind of hope she says no. I don't know what happens on Monday's show or Tuesday and how much Kane is going to be by her side through next week and everything she's going to experience. Uh, I'm, I'm going to appreciate that she has some people there to lean on, but if this is where Lily's head is now in terms of her relationship with Kane, I want her to stick to her guns. Because if Kane really wants to change his life, and I mean really change his life, he has to stop fighting for Lily. He has to stop making changes because he thinks that's what Lily wants him to do. And he has to start making these changes for himself. He has to start fighting for himself. And I know that that's, you know, that's sort of boring, but I'm okay with it for a while. Let's see Kane have this renaissance and have this reinvention. And maybe he'll also realize that his happy ending is with Tracy. <laughs> All aboard the train, train, choo-choo, Tracy plus Kane, the train. I am in. Literally, if YNR were to pair Tracy and Kane together, I would think that maybe some high-powered executive was listening to YNR chat last week, and they felt really bad for making me angsty and angry, and so they said, okay. Let's take two characters that we know Allie loves and we'll surprise her with this romance, with a, with a brand new romance. Okay, we know Allie loves Tracy. She is gushing over Tracy every single time she's on the screen. And we know that Allie loves Kane's package, so why don't we just give Tracy Kane's package? Allie is going to love it. And I do. I think we can be pretty sure that this week we saw the first scenes for the Winters family that were filmed after Kristoff's passing. It was really nice how there was a brand new portrait of 
Neil and Devon in the foreground of Devon's penthouse as we were having those scenes with Anna and Jet and Devon and Elena around the piano. And thinking about it, Devon was the last, Devon and Anna were the last people who had scenes with Kristoff. So it was nice to see that picture of Neil. And also, I think that these are visual clues from our storytellers that they absolutely have plans to continue on with the Winter's legacy, even though Neil will be gone. I mean, we're looking at Neil in the photo, but we're in the foreground, but we're seeing in the background where we're headed, what the future of the Winter's family is, and that it's still going to be a family and there's still going to be a bond there. So there are things to look forward to even after next week and, and you know, even though Neil's gone, the family still family legacy still exists. And I think that's really important. I noticed also that YNR had a lot of photos of Hillary and Lily in Devon's apartment. So I think that's also a visual cue. They're making sure that we understand that these characters are gone, but we're still keeping a symbol here that will connect us to our history. Even though I think Devon is so clearly moving on right now. He asked Elena out on a date to go to the restaurant opening with him. I really think that Devon and Elena are very natural together. I am really liking Devon right now, especially. He is so relaxed and it's coming off as kind of sexy for me and I've never really thought that Devon was that sexy. I always thought, you know, he's cute, he's Devon, but like he's really coming off as sexy to me right now. I think I'm definitely going to be able to sink my teeth into Devon and Elena eventually, although Elena freaking out about Devon's offer of a shopping spree to go pick out a dress for the restaurant opening is the equivalent of Lola freaking out over Kyle buying her an expensive purse. What is wrong with an expensive gift? What is the problem here? Like if Devon were to ask me out on a date and then offered me a shopping trip to go get a dress for the date, I would probably be like, oh, you don't have to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> If you insist, <laughs> you want to give me your credit card or should I just have them charge that to the department store? You just let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go. <laughs> what is the problem here? Seriously. I would think that wearing a dress that was gifted to Devon's ex-wife would make her feel more uncomfortable but for some reason she accepted that as the alternative idea. I swooned a little bit when Devon <laughs> brought down those dresses and he was showing Elena that she could wear them. They're totally, they've never been worn before. The tags are still on and he just picked one up and he swished it around and said, oh, I like this one. It has kind of a nice swing to it. And Anna looks at him and says, swing, really? And he says, yeah, swing. And yeah, he was just so freaking cute in it. Why am I crushing on Devon so hard right now? Maybe it's not that I'm crushing. Maybe it's that I'm connecting because I really do feel like I'm sensing something different in the actor's demeanor, like especially with Devon and Lily because you know, I know these scenes were filmed after they learned of Kristoff's passing. What what must it be like to be there on the set immediately following the news that Kristoff had passed away? I think just maybe somehow I'm feeling extra tuned in to the actor's personal grief. I just, I feel like I can feel it, you know? I, I don't know. I just... Uh, I'm scared for next week, really. I, I we're, we're moments away from the restaurant opening launch party and Lily has already mentioned that she's meeting Neil there and Devon mentions that he has been texting, he, he or he, he that Neil is supposed to be at the penthouse resting up for the event and he's been texting and calling him and hasn't received any response. So 
next week's the week, you know. We are going to find out <clears throat> what happened to Neil. I don't know. I don't want to be spoiled. Don't spoil me, please. Uh, I want to, I, I, I want to, I'm going to try to just really soak it in. Um, and it's, it's starting. Uh, it's supposed to start on Tuesday. So basically t all week starting Tuesday, everyone's going to be finding out what happened to Neil. If you are in Canada, you're probably going to see that episode tomorrow. I'm going to have to close my eyes so I don't don't accidentally see anything I don't want to see because I want to I want to be present for it. I mean, I'm terrified of it. There is this part of me that feels very selfish to say it, but I don't feel ready for this at all. I it's like it's too big. It feels too heavy and like it feels like I like I can't carry it, <laughs> and I know that I'm not the one, only one who's you know carrying it, and I know that I'm not here by myself. But it, it doesn't it feel like we're mourning twice? You know, we we have mourned the actor, and now we're mourning uh, the uh, the character, and it's it's heavy. <sighs> I know on on Friday. The talk is supposed to be doing a special episode where they're going to have some clips and I think some other people are going to be on the show to talk about Kristoff. And then Monday we're also going to have a special tribute episode for Kristoff. So basically this coming Tuesday through Friday will be all about Neil's passing. And then on Monday YNR will have their um their special tribute it's just like i feel like we've been existing in this weird little bubble of time where i i knew that christoph was gone but it wasn't addressed on the show so i could just believe that neil's out there somewhere being neil and now i know that i'm not going to be able to deny it anymore and it's just so hard it's just so hard and we also saw in the previews that Malcolm is at the door. We saw the preview of Malcolm coming to Devon's apartment and he was looking really good. And I feel like I can't, can't like even fully appreciate the magnitude of Malcolm's hunkiness in his distressed leather jacket with the wool collar. It just doesn't feel appropriate. <laughs> ah, the levels, the levels of pain. Next week is going to be hard, you guys. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna be checking in at the website a little extra so we can chat about what we're seeing throughout the week. Cause I'm probably gonna need you guys a little extra. My cells are turning over. Maybe that's a good description of how I sort of feel on the inside right now, thinking about what next week is gonna bring for us. But actually that was our quote from last week. It had nothing to do with nothing. <laughs> my cells are turning over was actually Billy commenting about his black pearl body buff treatment that he got at the Las Vegas spa with Victoria. My cells are turning over. That's like it would be a good feeling. <laughs> it was a weird line though. I was expecting no one to get it, but Jamie pressed Henry, Sheila, Gretel22, T. Nicole, Ambreen, Michelle, and Diana all guessed it right. Here's one. I'm going to let this be a little bit of a mantra for the week for me. Sipping tea, staring into space. That's what I'm going to go with all week. Sipping tea and staring into space. I have at least one tea bag of hot tea every day so that's what i'm gonna try to that's gonna i'm gonna make that my zen moment this week i'm gonna make sure i'm sipping tea and staring into space who do you think said that if you think you know you can go to yrchat.com to leave your guess and if you guess right then i will give you your shout out on next week's yr chat Tony had left me a comment asking if I could kind of explain a little bit how the website works. And I thought, oh, well, that's a good idea. It's at yrchat.com, basically just a blog. Every day I go in and I'll post 
funny photo captions, just little moments that I think are stand out from the show. But I also have a watch and chat post that's there for each individual week. So as anyone is watching the show, all you have to do is click that link and you can chat about that day's show, week's show. You don't have to be watching at the day that it airs, just whenever you're watching. You can chime in and talk about that week as a unit right there. Um, I refresh those once a week, so um, there's always it's, al it's always there for you if you want to leave comments on the current week, or even you can go back and leave comments on the previous week. And then I also have the poll, so I leave that open for the full week so that the results are current and don't kind of change over time. So I leave it open for one week and then I read out the final results on the YNR chat. So if you go to the poll while it's currently open, you can vote in it, but if you go to the poll after I've recorded YNR chat, then it'll be closed and you can just view the results. And I also have the who said it quote there, where again, just like a blog, all you have to do is click on the link where it says who said it, and there's a text box where you can enter in your entry. And basically all that does is it sends an email to me uh, with your guess. If you get it right, I just save it and I give you your shout out for the following week. Uh, but that's a place, I think that's the only place on the website where you can't leave a comment because I can't have just everybody publicly commenting on the quote or then everybody would say, oh yeah, that was Devon. And then now everybody knows it's Devon and I'm reading a really long list of people. So I keep those results hidden until I read them on the next week's chat. But anyway, that's it in a nutshell. The I think the the best part of the website is the watch and chat thread. That's where I always am checking in and always commenting and reading just because it's nice to chat about the show in between Sundays. So if you would like to do that, it's a good place to go. And you can jump in anywhere. The whole point of it is to feel welcome and open and it's not like a you know a, a, a super vicious place where you can't feel like you can say what you really think. I want everybody to be honest there and friendly and that's what it's there for. So let's read some more of the comments for the week. Ambreen is weighing in on that. Billy and Victoria poll saying, I voted no to Billy and Victoria getting back together because they had already been married before and Victor would just get in the way. <laughs> I know, wasn't it funny? Um, at one of the screenshots that I isolated for the week was Victoria sending that text message to Victor and she was in the process of considering whether or not to get remarried to Billy and she was texting Victor, I miss you, I would, could really use your advice right now. And I thought to myself, really? You think Victor's gonna give you balanced advice on whether or not you should marry Billy Abbott? He is going to tell you, no! What are you even thinking about? Do not marry that Billy Abbott, that Billy Boy Abbott. Forget about it. Focus on your career. That's what Victor would tell you. <laughs> but you're right, Ambrain. He's just gonna interfere. You know it. Tanya says, my vote on Vic Billy and Victoria is no. Because as sweet as it is for him to try to make her feel better in Vegas and to be by her side, I'm just tired of the same getting together and breaking up and getting together and breaking up. I want something new, Tanya says. But I do have to say that what Billy said, that he wanted to give her something she doesn't want to run away from, I thought that was really sweet. Billy is really sweet. That's definitely not in question for me. I think my desire to not see Billy and Victoria together really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the individual characters. It's more about the story and just a desire to see something new. I think because we were on the roller coaster ride of Victoria and JT and the murder trial for so long. And I think most, most just what I'm wanting is something fresh just so that we can, I don't know, have a little bit of a new beginning. I mean, if, if Billy and Victoria were to get together 
uh, several months down the road or maybe after we've had a little bit of a breaky break for both of them, I think that would be fine. But I agree with you, Tanya, that it's just, ugh, that's something new, please. Well, Colleen voted yes to Billy and Victoria saying that Billy and Victoria keep changing and growing. They're a legacy couple. I appreciate the way Billy is hovering protectively over Victoria and making sure that she's adjusting back to her life after JT. I liked the way he stood behind Victoria at the card game and fed Sinead a fake tell, helping Victoria get her win. He didn't flip out over Brandon, and he did the responsible thing, recognizing that he was tempted by the gambling, and he reached out to Jack and got himself into a meeting. The only disappointing thing was how Jack blew him off. And Astra also voted yes, saying, I like Billy and Victoria together. I was really a fan of Billy Miller's Billy with Victoria. I think this version of Billy and Victoria have chemistry, and I'm curious to see where it goes with them. If it doesn't work out, I'm not opposed to Billy and Victoria seeing other people, just as long as Billy doesn't get back with Phyllis and Victoria doesn't get back with JT. <laughs> Victoria getting back with JT wouldn't bother me at this point, I think, if we can wipe away the brain tumor thing. I'm just desperate for something new. Superplex did follow up with me, by the way, and it jogged my memory about JT's status, that he uh, is pleading guilty for his crimes. Christine had mentioned that. Uh, but I, mean, I think that's, is that the last we heard about JT? He's pleading guilty. Um, and I guess we are just to assume that he's going off to jail. Hmm. Oh, Mary Ann answered no on Billy and Victoria getting back together. Mary Ann says, I answered no and will not waffle until Y&R pulls a second Fruit Basket Turnover Replay after the Retro Phyllis recast and does a Retro Billy recasting. The current Victoria and Billy Miller were my favorite Billy pairing or Victoria pairing. I preferred Jason Thompson with Gina's Phyllis and with Gina leaving, I feel like they should pair the current Billy and Victoria with new partners. Hmm, yeah, you know, let's see. I just think Victoria and Kane would be a little bit exciting. But I don't know who that would leave Billy with. But a Billy and Victoria Kane pairing might not be bad, or like a triangle, that might not be bad. Well, I mean, I, I have to be careful because 80% of you are wanting Billy and Victoria, so I gotta make sure I'm representing the pro Billy and Victoria opinions. Daisy said, I did like Victoria reminiscing about her life and love with Billy. I think it's best, though, that she choose to slow it down. It will ultimately be better for them to get to know each other again, rather than quickly jump in with both feet. Maybe they'll remarry later this year and we'll get a winter wedding. The Newmans and the Abbots snowed in. It would be fabulous. <laughs> Well, I think you're hitting on something there, um, Daisy, also in that, yeah, it, it does feel like maybe if Billy and Victoria are going to get back together, we need to make some new memories and make some current pull for them to be together rather than just basing it all on the past. Like, we should be together because we were together before and because we have kids. That's not super exciting to watch, I don't think. But yeah, if YNR takes the year, and does a nice slow build on Victoria and Billy's relationship, then yeah, sure, I'll get into a winter wedding. I can always be convinced. Diana says, Mariah is downplaying the whole brick incident with that note. I know Mariah is supposed to be tough, but she is not acknowledging how dangerous it was. Mariah or Tessa could have been killed or suffered severe head or brain damage. What is Mariah thinking? Basically telling her mother that it wasn't that big of a deal. If I were Mariah, I would be watching my back and wearing a helmet for a while. <laughs> You are so right, Diana. Mariah played it down. She really acted like it was not a big deal, but she's got to be terrified on the inside, right? Tessa was terrified. Tessa opened up to Lola about it at the restaurant opening, and it's clear that Tessa's taking it seriously more so than Mariah. 
I have a feeling that means we're gonna see more to come. Yeah, and I hope it's not a violent thing. We'll find out. It, this, this feels like a fresh story because it, I, I can't imagine it's connected to anything else we've seen uh, else on the show. It seems new and that's nice. T. Nicole says, Ray is trying to convince Paul that there may have been no crime against Lola. Uh, please, Ray, can you at least act like you are a concerned brother who wants justice for his little sister? <laughs> Ray is supposed to be a family man, right? And he is actively covering up a crime that was committed against his sister. And he, at the same time, was also saying that about, well, if it's Arturo's baby, then I want to turn Mia in. <laughs> and I know he was, he said that so off the cuff. I don't think he meant it in reality that if the baby turns out to be Arturo's, I'm going to tell the cops. But it, it just felt a little, uh, ugh, it felt a little ick to me. Yeah, Ray's dumb right now. The way he approached Paul was dumb. <laughs> I also, at the website, um, I think maybe it was in the watch and chat thread, I screen capped a picture of Paul's face <laughs> when Ray tried to feed him this story. And it was so clear that Paul was like, mm hmm. So no crime. Your conclusion about the crime is that there was no crime. And Paul already suspects that Ray knows more than he's letting on. Ray just busted himself, basically. All Ray is doing is giving Paul more little clues to go on to figure out that it's all a lie. And even though I feel like on the surface, Ray is staying on the show, I just keep thinking, how is he going to get out of this? Paul's caught up, find out that Ray was involved in covering this up. And I would think that Paul would bring charges. <sighs> well, let's, um, let's talk about this whole Kyle and Summer and Lola situation, which I have to say, even though it is extremely frustrating, it gets my blood boiling in a good way because it's something to talk about. It's almost so audacious that I feel compelled to talk about it with passion. And I've noticed that a lot of commenters all around have been talking with a lot of passion about Kyle and Lola and Summer. And I think that's a good thing at the end of the day. Lucy says, how can Lola tell Kyle not to sleep with Summer when they're married and sleeping in the same bed? Kyle is burning a candle from both ends. It's time for Lola to move on. Summer will never take her claws out of Kyle. Is there any chance, do you think, Lucy, that Summer might take her claws out of Kyle? What is Summer's reaction now? Summer has seen the necklace. Where do we go next? I was making a little bit of a joke about the knife and a potential major revenge. Is it possible that YNR is foreshadowing some big revenge for Summer? Or are we going to see her evolve past her bad girl ways? And are we going to be led to believe that she really has changed and she's going to let the two lovebirds be together? Summer's character is at a crossroads. And I do wonder, did the writers convert her into a good girl just so they could bring down the hammer and show us what a bad girl she could really be? Or are they wanting to put her in good girl status for a little bit longer and show her doing the right thing after, you know, making up for all of the bad things she did with Billy? Like, are they really trying to show an evolution of that character? Will we ultimately see Summer let those claws out? I don't know. It really could go either way at this point. T. Nicole says, I am confused on how Kyle thinks he will make Summer not want to be with him without her wanting revenge. Um, how will Summer not want to be with you? That's right. Telling her that you only love Lola and that you do not want to stay married to her and, um, and are leaving her regardless than keeping living this lie. Kyle, you told Summer that you almost slept with Lola and she took it as a great test for your marriage and how committed you are to her. 
He needs to stand firm with Summer or let Lola move on. I am still confused as to what happened to their whole no sex rule when they agreed to this marriage deal. Also, does Summer even remember that she said one year and then Kyle can leave if he's not happy? Ooh, that's right, T. Nicole. There was a no sex rule. <laughs> And Kyle happily chose to ignore it, by the way. Kyle didn't have to be involved in, with Summer sexually. It, the original deal was always, let's get married. We don't have to have sex. Give it a year. If you don't decide you want to stay married to me, then we can call the whole thing off. And Kyle, on the wedding night, chose to throw the no sex rule out the window and he initiated the sex. Kyle is the one that started it and now he's caught in between the two women and he has to pretend now and backtrack that he doesn't want to have sex with Summer. This thing is a sham. It is a mess. This is a mess. And Ellen one of the things I appreciate about her comments is that she's like on Lola's side in all of this. And I think that's, it's interesting because the majority of people are, I think, feeling bad for Summer and are mad at Kyle. But I like, Ellen, that you're representing something a little different here by saying, nah, no, no. Summer stole her man while Lola was in a coma. Lola has every right to stake her claim on Kyle. Maybe she can ask Tessa to write a song for her titled, It's Annulment Time, Baby. <laughs> and Ellen also says, Selfish Summer marries Kyle when she knows he loves someone else. Otherwise, she lets the woman he loves die. And Lola's the cruel one. That is a fair, fair point, Ellen. I know it's it's tough because I just feel sorry for Summer on a human level, but at the same time, I know she's gotten herself into this. I mean, Kyle was the one that suggested the marriage thing, but Summer should have been smart enough to say no. It was never good for anybody. I guess at the end of the day, they all kind of made this situation right, but you'd make a compelling point that Lola was in the coma when a lot of this went down. She didn't have a say in how that arrangement took place for saving her life. Yeah, good point. Let's switch gears here and talk about old Jack. Consuela says Peter Bergman is definitely one of my favorite actors on YNR. His emotional scenes, I cry with him. He just takes you there and makes you feel with, feel with him. He is really good. Peter Bergman was really excellent this past week and he always is. He's a good crier. He's so sentimental and he does just have a wonderful way of drawing you into his story, whatever it may be. Shakona says, my heart broke for him this week. I think he feels like an abandoned little boy after all these years. All he wanted was for his mother to be around and she chose to have flings above and instead of being there for her family who she was supposed to love. And he was left to pick up all of the pieces. That must have been rough. I can empathize with that. That is definitely Jack's plight in a nutshell there. I don't think that was really very much part of Jack's backstory in the past. I think that's new, isn't it? We really didn't get the piece of information that Jack was expected at a young age. And I think he even said, I had to go to work at age 15. Um, I think that's a new piece of information, though, that we've gotten um, as a result of this last writing regime, that Jack was expected to help John, that there were pressures put upon him. I didn't really ever get that sense before. I always thought that it was John doing everything he could to raise his family despite the fact that his evil wife had left him. And John is the great man who raised these three kids on his own and also built a company. And it's only, I think, within the last couple of years that we've had that rewriting where we're finding out that Jack was the one who had all of that pressure on him. And it really does feed into the relationship that he has with Dina and it, it really works on a level of bringing Dina back onto the show and giving her that backstory too. Gary says, do you think that all of these little scenes are leading up to a misdiagnosis of Dina? 
Jack is saying, you know, I, I have so many things I need to say to my mother that I'll never have the opportunity to because she's not present enough to understand any of it. She doesn't even remember any of these things. Gary says, I think that there could be a, 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 di a misdiagnosis story uh, without disturbing the integrity of the Alzheimer's story. And uh, Gary also mentioned that they could tie it in with Graham, like make Dina have received some kind of quack diagnosis. I hadn't even thought of that. I didn't think about what we're seeing on screen presently, possibly tying into a misdiagnosis of her Alzheimer's, but I feel totally okay with that. If that's what where YNR wants to go to bring Dina back in a greater capacity, I'm fine with that. I wish they would. Ellen dropping down another really fair point here about Jack saying, if you feel so abandoned, Jack, then why have you abandoned your own son, Chemo? And you weren't present for Kyle when he was growing up either. <sighs> Jack was never father of the year. That's for sure. We've been talking about old Jack and chemo for a long time. And Diane took Kyle away from him. And Jack really hasn't shown a whole lot of wonderful fathering skills. I think Kyle had a lot of resentment toward Jack when he came back into town. It's a little full circle moment there. I guess Jack never learned how to be a great parent, although again, that was always the impression that I had of John, that John raised his kids. Like, I always got the impression that John raised his kids to try to do the right thing and be the right thing, and Jack was not a chip off the old block in that way. That Jack was a playboy and he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Think about the roots of Jack and Victor's uh, feud. Victor always viewed Jack as just coming from a wealthy family and having it easy and it, w it was the antithesis of what Victor's childhood was and now we're filling in that backstory showing that Jack's childhood was a little something different and I guess I just have to accept that. Hey Laura commenting about that Jack of Hearts poster saying what a lousy ad who's in charge of marketing over at my beauty uh, <laughs> yeah I have to admit that ad poster with Carrie and the guy it was it was a little cringy but how about that and uh, Anna and Jet poster that Devon had made for the opening. Somebody in YNR's poster de department was working double time this week. Shakona says, Devon lost his birth mom to drugs, lost his adoptive mom to a fall, and his wife and unborn child to a car accident, and now his dad. How many hits can one man take? I hope that he does not fall into the arms of that woman staying in his house. She seems like a schemer, much like Tessa. And I hope that he doesn't turn to alcohol and drugs. Please turn to Abby instead and have something good come out of this. They both lost a child and they are good people who will work hard. I want them together. Oh yeah, it did seem like YNR was laying us some groundwork for Devon and Abby again. And uh, now it just seems like maybe that's not the direction. I think um, YNR is building Devon and Elena. I think they are planning on building out the winner's family there. But yeah, I do worry about Devon and how he's gonna cope with this, but I'm also feeling pretty confident in him. He seems really together right now. He seems like he knows what he wants and what he's doing, and I'm gonna trust that he does. Gary commenting about Lily and uh, Kane here. Gary says, I think that Lily may be the very first soap opera character, like front burner character, not a peripheral character, who has ever actually served a proper prison term. In the prison, she lived quietly and respectfully and she got out appropriately early. Kudos to YNR. I really think this is an absolute first. 
I think so too. Do we know for sure that Lily is gone for good? She talked about her new job. She's been offered a position at the prison being a teacher. She also talked about, you know, deciding to live near the prison for that and about Maddie and Charlie maybe choosing to go to a school near the prison. I think that speaks possibly to the twins not staying on the show for very much longer. Oh, but, or is there any chance that Lily is gonna be staying around after learning of her father's death? I mean, are we for sure that Lily is going to be gone? Or is there any chance that she's gonna decide to stay in town to be around her family now that she's learned that Chris that learned that Neil is gone? I don't know, but I, I I really do like your point about Lily's prison term that it's very unique that that Wyanna actually sent a main character to prison and pulled it off, uh, and I just don't think she's coming back. Here's a comment from Diana. It really irks me how Lily is acting so holier than thou. She was reminding Cain all about the bad decisions and screw-ups that he's done, throwing Cain's one-night stand with Juliet in his face, and that he kissed Victoria. Lily has done the exact same thing with other people. I know I've said this before, but it needs to be mentioned every time she reminds Cain of what he's done. Lily cheated and had an affair on Cain with Joe, not once, but twice. She didn't believe Kane, her own husband, when he told her that he was being framed for extortion. She took Joe's side instead, who was virtually a complete stranger. It wasn't until it was revealed that Joe was the bad guy that she went back to Kane, and she was very lucky that Kane forgave her. Lily also kissed Jordan the photographer while he was married, or excuse me, while she was married to Kane. Jordan also ended up being not the stand-up guy that she thought he was. How about the worst decision Lily ever made in her life when she turned her head for several seconds to yell at Hillary without even looking at the road? She killed her brother's wife by being very careless and went to prison for it. Her own son could have been killed. That doesn't sound like she's been the perfect wife just as Kane has not been the perfect husband. I wish Kane would show a little bit more of a backbone with Lily. He's too wimpy when he, he's too wimpy when he is with her and too soft spoken. Not once did Kane bring up any of Lily's bad choices. Sorry, but I had to vent my feelings about Lily. I'll be happy to see Lily and Kane's relationship come to an end. Ooh, well, there's a good perspective, Diana. Yeah, I think Kane is just fighting, fighting for Lily, um, in spite of maybe himself at this point. Allie says, any theory on why Kane hesitated just outside of Tracy's door? There's obviously a bond being developed there, even if it's not romantic. Was he just not wanting to burden her or bother her? <sighs> Isn't it weird that Kane went to Tracy's doorstep, someone who has been open and welcoming toward him, and at the very last minute, he decides to turn away. And Tracy had this odd feeling that he was there, or that someone was at the door. She went to the door, looked out, and he was already gone. What to make of that? Shakona says, was it guilt? Maybe Kane's developing feelings for Tracy that he thinks shouldn't exist. And Zuperplex says, Kane is obviously interested in having a caring, understanding shoulder to lean on in this moment of crisis. He's like a ship lost out at sea with a broken rudder. I do not think, however, that Tracy is as committed to playing that role unconditionally. I think her motivations are compromised by her pecuniary interests, such as using Kane's plight as a resource material for a book. Perhaps that's Tracy's dilemma in her family dynamic. She likes to consider herself as the rock upon which the Abbott family may turn in their moment of crisis, but in the final analysis, Tracy's primary focus in life will always be her writing career. Well, I don't even think Weiner has very much mentioned uh, Tracy doing any new books recently. I didn't read it like that. I read it like Tracy was inspired by Kane's story, but it would be interesting to see a slight little turn of something in Tracy's character where she decides she wants to use these people for some source material. Um, Superplus also asked about that K Kane and Tracy love affair. Is it going to happen? Ellen responds, 
you know, I had the same thought, a Kane and Tracy bromance. Tracy really seems to understand him. They sure put younger women with older men on the show all the time. The Carrie and Jack romance was far-fetched to me. He was twice her age and it showed, but no one seemed to complain. I'd love to see a May-December romance with an older woman and not just a fling like Nikki and Arturo. Shakona responds, the younger man, older woman thing only works well with a specific type of cougar. For example, Gloria, who can be paired with any young man because she's so entertaining to watch. I don't think that Tracy has it in her. She might just panic and have a total meltdown. But maybe I'm completely wrong. She might just be the wildest cougar of them all. I certainly would not repel in horror. I like when they spice things up. I think that's what I like about it is the fact that it would be really unexpected of Tracy. <laughs> and Tracy was married to Brad Carlton. I don't think she's totally naive. I think maybe what they're trying to show us with Tracy and Kane is that Tracy is also someone who has instincts that are maybe not always so pure and she works every day to make herself better and make herself pure. That would be interesting. What do we find out that Tracy's sweetness is just something that she has to work every day to try to put out there, but maybe there's a little bit of sour underneath of it all. Ooh. Oh, Superplex mentioned that Lionar has changed the Catherine Chancellor Memorial since repairing the water pipe. Um, I, I, I noticed that too. The statue in the park when Kane and Tracy were talking, and maybe Mia and Arturo too, is different. We did have that red sculpture that Jill bought, and now the sculpture there is a little bit different. Why the change? Kyle says, this head writer transition is rough. The fact that Nikki is cozying up to Paul, Cricket, and Ray within a month of them all being total adversaries is completely unbelievable. The only consistent thing about the show lately is the sets. Crimson Lights, the Abbott Mansion. Although, now that I think about it, even those are changing. It seems like everyone's front door has been eliminated. Victoria's House, Ashby House, the GCAC. Ooh! See, I didn't notice that, Kyle, until you said it, but... Um, I did notice that the Abbott house had an extended front porch when Kane was standing there waiting. You know, I don't know what he was hesitating about, but it seemed like the Abbott porch got bigger. And now through the week, since you've noticed it, I have noticed that a lot of other uh, of the sets have gotten smaller. Kyle also follows up by saying, that the limited front door space makes sense from a soundstage perspective, but it's pretty distracting to a set lunatic like me. Everyone now enters Victoria's house from the dining room area after a quick ding dong or door slam noise, very community theater. And of course, the Ashby twins bop in and out of the breakfast look like clockwork. I do miss the GCAC entryway with its rotating glass door and the coat check and the stairs which gave it some great depth. Now the bar area is all sealed off with opaque walls and it feels claustrophobic. But if given the chance, I'd rather have more smaller sets than a few larger sets, so I'll stop complaining. I didn't even notice that the GCAC was walled off. Oh my gosh, I have to go back and watch that. They had to, I'm sure, make room for the new restaurant. It's clear that that's probably where we're gonna be hanging out. We're gonna be hanging out at Society a whole lot now. Um, but I also do agree with you. I'd rather have more small sets than the larger ones. You just need a couple larger ones so that the casts can come together. But I know, I like the variety uh, in the scenery. But it's spring and summer, and they're probably also building out the parks and so that we can have more outdoor stuff too. I know, they have limited space, but yeah, that's really interesting. The sets got changed now that you mention it. So speaking of society, what do you guys think of our new restaurant chatters? Uh, I think the word, the name society is a little weird. At first when I heard it, I was like, mm, I don't know. Laura says it's easy to make some bad jokes like customer phones in to society for a reservation and society answers the phone. Hi, society. <laughs> Genoa City, hi, society. 
Um, Anna says Abby looked like she was the ringmaster of Barnum and Bailey's circus. <laughs> All she needed was a top hat. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about the name, uh, but I like the decor, but I could pass on Abby's silver sparkly uh, suit. It was a little weird. It was a little jarring. Barnum and Bailey's. Liz says, I wish the writers would have paid homage to Lola's Latin Hispanic inspired menu when naming the restaurant. Abby was not going to move forward with her new restaurant venture unless she had Lola as her executive chef along with her bold and innovative cuisine. Society doesn't speak to Lola's culture or her vision for the restaurant in any way. I seem to recall Lola wanting the restaurant to feel welcoming and like you were eating with family. I think Mi Familia would have been a more authentic name. Ooh, yeah, that would be a good name for Lola's restaurant. But I was starting to get the idea, Liz, as the development of this was going on, that it was not Lola's restaurant. This is Abby's restaurant. She wanted Lola to do the job, but Lola's dream of having her own restaurant still hasn't been met. Lola's just working for Abby. Oh, let's see. Astra says, is anyone else disappointed that the new writing regime hasn't brought back the next on segments at the very end of the show? I personally miss getting a teaser of the next day's episode and I hoped it would be back. I agree. That would be wonderful if they brought the previews back for every single episode. I would, again, I know I said it at the time, but I would way rather have the next on YNR than the previously on YNR. Okay, everybody. I hope you have a really lovely Easter and a really lovely rest of your week. Go to yrchat.com, leave your comments, and also mourn with us. Throughout the week, it's going to be a tough one, so I would love to see some more people come in there and weighing in on how YNR's handling uh, Neil's death, and we'll just come together, and that's how we'll get through it. I love you guys, and I will see you next Sunday at this time. Bye!